Shalom, brothers and sisters. This Thursday, I thought we we're going to revisit everyone's favorite topic, polygamy. I got a call last week from a woman who was a little riled up, I'll say, about polygamy. And she asked my thoughts on it, in particular about Jacob. Uh, let's see, what is this? Jacob chapter 2. Oh, it's chapter 2 in both the REV and the OPV. Um, REV is Community of Christ or Reorganized Branch of the Faith, and OPV is the Brighamite Salt Lake City Church and their offshoots, that branch of the faith. But this isn't a new argument, and it was one I was planning on addressing if the podcast ever got to a point to where I got to Jacob chapter 2. <clears throat> But she was making accusations, asking me, you know, how would your wife feel if you just ran off and married another woman and blah, blah, blah. And I had to explain to her that in the Latter-day Saint movement, if, if you're going to be a polygamist correctly, and this is Doctrine and Covenants 132 for the Salt Lake City Church, um, and it's the way it works in my mind, in, in the revelations I've received, I should add, it isn't one person going out and marrying another person. The one thing she said over and over again is that when you're married, the two become one, and that's absolutely correct. And the revelation I received mirrors that, saying that the man, the woman, or man and man, or woman and woman, decide this together, and they as one decide to enter polygamy. It's not something that a man or a woman just comes home and says, hey, Got some news for you. This is what's up. Take another spouse. And I shared with her a story, and I, I didn't name names, but a polygamous family that I know that in my mind embodies exactly what polygamy should be. They were not planning on being polygamists, but they all received revelations from the Lord as consenting adults and decided to act upon the wishes of God as they understood them. All of them together in harmony. That to me is what polygamy is about. And she referenced, the woman I was speaking to, this scripture in the book of Jacob chapter 2. And I'm going to read it to you really quickly. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people began to wax in iniquity. They understood not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Uh, I'm, I can keep going, but I'm going to stop there. So there's a couple things I want to address here. Number one, notice that it's only talking about David and Solomon. It doesn't mention Abraham whose wife gave her husband another husband, and also who she herself, Abraham, gave his wife to other men to marry. It doesn't condemn that. It doesn't condemn the law, as written on the Torah, that if a man dies, the sister marries the husband, so she has someone to provide for her. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that that's a law that we need to be worried about today. Today, women can work outside the home. They have options, and so we live in a society now where if a husband dies, the woman can choose to take a spouse. It's not something that she needs to do for mere survival. But what about David and Solomon that makes their case special? Well, for one thing, it mentions concubines. I looked up the word concubine in the Google Dictionary because it's the easiest, and it says in polygamous societies... A woman who lives with a man but has a lower status than his wife or wives. And another term for it is a mistress. And when you read chapter 2 of the book of Jacob, it makes it pretty clear to me that what these Nephites were doing was not taking another wife. They were setting their current wife to the side, saying, hey, thanks for having kids. You're on your own. I'm marrying this younger girl. She's very attractive. And it made, obviously, these women cry because their love, the love of their lives, the man who 
they have been providing and caring for in, in whatever their duties were in their society at that time is just abandoning them and the families that they built. So, again, looking at David and Solomon, it also says wives. What did David and Solomon do? Well, King David had an affair with a woman. And then when he got her pregnant, he tried to cover it up. And when that didn't work, he had the guy killed to try to cover it up. And, spoiler, it didn't work. Because the whole world knows about it. It's written in the Bible. Very famous, very famous story. What about Solomon? It says that he married all these foreign women. And, and I don't have a problem with marrying foreign women. But in that society, at that time, that meant that these women were worshipping foreign gods. They were worshipping idols. And later in his life, I don't know if he had dementia or Alzheimer's or if he just forgot the Lord. I don't know how you could if you're the wisest person to ever live. But he started worshipping these idols to please his wives. He put his wives before the Lord. So we see here what the Nephites are doing and what King David and King Solomon did and this idea of owning women as concubines, having women that are in a lesser status than a wife. These are all, as Jacob calls them here, abominations because we're not loving and respecting one another. If you want to enter polygamy, when I say you, I mean you and your spouse. So if you're, I guess if you're a single person and you decide, hey, I'm going to go look to get married. And when I pick a spouse and that spouse picks me, I make sure I have that conversation with them, letting them know I plan to be polygamous. Even though it's not I. I'm looking for something so that we can plan to be polygamous. Now, again, I want to be very clear that my wife and I are monogamous. We have no interest in being polygamists. But that doesn't mean that we can't love those that are. That doesn't mean we can't accept those that are. And I'm going to try to keep this short. I'm about seven and a half minutes right now. I want to touch on Joseph Smith's polygamy again for a moment. I keep seeing these videos popping up and people talking about, you know, who did Joseph Smith marry? Who did he have sex with? You know, what was he doing? And I couldn't help but think, you know, I, I try to put myself in the place of these people. How would I feel if 100 years from now, 200 years from now, people are like, so I'm trying to gather all the evidence. Who's Dave hooking up with? And I really don't understand the point in this. Because if you believe in polygamy and you believe the Lord has called you to be a polygamist, do you really need Joseph Smith to be a polygamist for you to be a polygamist? Isn't God telling you to be a polygamist good enough? James Strang had polygamy, so they're, you know, if, if you want to believe James Strang and follow him and be a polygamist, go for it. Brigham Young, <clears throat> excuse me, Brigham Young was a polygamist. You want to follow him, be a polygamist. I believe that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. So if you want to follow Joseph Smith and be a polygamist, you know, go for it. But you really don't need, we don't really need to drag out his personal life and use it to try to bolster our arguments for our own personal theologies. Likewise, if you don't believe in polygamy, you think it's a sin, you think it's an abomination, don't be a polygamist. If God's telling you not to practice polygamy, don't. If you want to believe that Joseph Smith was not a polygamist, you want to believe he was monogamist, do it. But why argue with other people and try to force them to believe that he was? The evidence goes both ways. And I don't believe that everyone that was declared an enemy because he called, they called him a polygamist was a bad person. I think some people found out about polygamy, tried to expose it because they thought they were doing the Lord's work. I don't think everybody is a bad person. And I don't think everybody that followed Joseph Smith was a good person. 
I think that as people, we try to do our best. And what we need to do is focus on what the Lord wants for us and stop digging so deeply into the personal lives of other people. Now, again, if you want to be a monogamous, Joseph Smith III pushed monogamy very hard. Sidney Rigdon pushed monogamy very hard. There are lots of other Latter-day Saints that pushed monogamy. If you want to believe Joseph Smith was a monogamist, go for it. But do we really need to drag up and fight over these things? Because the thing that bothered me the most wasn't this woman's interpretation of the scriptures. It was the fact that when I told them about this family that I knew, and this is a kind, loving family, in, in my mind, if, you're, if you were to say, Dave, can you please describe to me the perfect example of a family practicing polygamy? This is the family that I would point to. I'd be like, look at these guys. Don't, I'm not going to tell you who you are. I don't really want you to go looking for them or see how they're doing it. But they received revelation. They love one another. They came to this choice as one being. What more can you ask? So again, the Lord says in Matthew chapter 5, the end of the chapter, I'm not going to try to do the verses from memory because I don't remember. I think it's like 38 through 48 or something like that. But it's the last part. He says, you've been told to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, and I may be misquoting as I'm paraphrasing here, but I say unto you, love your enemy. That part I know is correct. Love your enemy. And then at the very last verse, he says, be you perfect. That's how you're perfect, by loving your enemies. Because if you can love your enemies, you're definitely loving your neighbors, your friends, your family, and everybody else, right? You, everything else that he said up to that point, if you can love your neighbor, if you're living that law of love, all the rest of that's going to fall in line and you're going to obey all those commandments. You, you won't be able to help it. So my question for you is this. Instead of going and cherry picking scriptures, can you love your, your enemy? Because I feel like the people who are trying to push these things are just, they see polygamists and mono, monogamists as their enemies, but we're all Latter-day Saints. We all need to learn to love one another and get along. If you can't love your enemy, the polygamist, or your enemy, the monogamist, then you're rejecting the Word of God as taught by Jesus Christ Himself. So I want to ask you, are the polygamists, are the monogamists your enemies? And if they are, are you willing to obey your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and love them? The Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, the Fellowship of Christ, is an ecumenical movement. Our goal is to find the things we have in common, because Satan already does a great job tearing us apart with the few things that we don't. So that's my Thursday thought for you, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.